welcome to Games is Lit 101, and, more specifically, welcome to Counterpoint, an occasional segment on the show where we'll be discussing the merits and failings of various arguments against the status of video games as an art form. Now, let me clarify something really quick here. This argument is done. I'm fully aware of that. Video games are art. And at this point, that is so clear that many say that there's not even a point in talking about it anymore. On that last bit, though, I do disagree a little bit. I mean, firstly, this show is not just for gamers. It's also intended for non-gamers, and even more specifically, academics. And where the gaming community has largely, still not fully, but largely accepted video games as an art form, that's not nearly so well understood outside of those circles. So there's still some value in talking about it here. Aside from that, though, I do think that there's actually some interesting stuff that we can learn from examining these arguments instead of just dismissing them out of hand. Yeah, they are flawed and invalid in the end, but they do bring up some interesting points. So we're going to talk about them a little bit. If you've watched my previous videos, then you know that I hold interactivity as central to the medium of video games. The ability to interact with a game is what makes video games unique in the world of art. But you may be surprised how often this fact actually gets turned against the medium. Many of you may remember the late Roger Ebert's bout with the video game community over this very issue. Roger Ebert was a very influential film critic who, along with his colleague Gene Siskel, essentially invented the art of modern film criticism itself. And over the years, Roger Ebert wrote a few articles claiming not only that video games were not as artistically mature as other mediums or something, but in fact that they were incapable by their very nature of being an art form. Now, I, I know that bringing this up is old hat at this point. This has been talked to death, all the points made, but this isn't about attacking Roger Ebert here. He actually did have some interesting points, however flawed his conclusions were. One such point was this. I believe art is created by an artist. If you change it, you become the artist. Art seeks to lead you to an inevitable conclusion, not a smorgasbord of choices. These statements summarize the heart of one of the major arguments in the discussion of video games as an art form. Ebert believed that by allowing players to directly interact with and alter video games, they were no longer the vision and creation of an artist. Many were quick to angrily dismiss this, and it is certainly an inaccurate way of looking at video games, but it it does raise an interesting question. How does interactivity affect the creator's vision for a work? Now, it's important to note the perspective that Ebert is coming from on this, which is fairly easy for me because it's one that I come from myself. Ebert believes that art is something that is given meaning by its creator, something that's created by someone for a reason. Now, different interpretations of an artist's work are one thing, but giving anyone the ability to just alter what an artist has created would completely remove that whole center of intentional creation. I mean, imagine if everyone who watched The Lion King could alter how the story went to their whims. If they could just decide Simbo ran away somewhere else entirely, or decided to ignore the vision of his father near the end in favor of staying with Timon and Pumbaa. It would be really easy for most people to mess up the whole theme of dealing with tragedy and taking responsibility. Or if, as Ebert says in his article, anyone viewing Romeo and Juliet could just decide that the two should go through the entire play naked and standing on their hands. Seriously, that's completely ridiculous, but we all know someone who would do that. That would be really ridiculous. That would unquestionably completely ruin Romeo and Juliet. So I can understand how based on Ebert's concept of video games, this ability to alter the work would present a pretty big problem. Thankfully for all of us, though, that's not actually how video games work. At all. Let's just take a look at the concept of player choice a bit. To use a well-known example, let's talk a little bit about Mass Effect. Let's just pretend I made a joke about the horrible ending and move on, okay? Mass Effect prides itself on a wide variety of experiences for different players. It's an epic science fiction story where the player is often given major choices that alter the story in various ways. What's more, each game reads the previous save files, so it isn't contained within each game. Even choices made in the first game will affect events in the third. And there is a wide variety of options. 
By the third game, some things happened to people that I hadn't even considered possible, because the stage was set for those events by different choices they made all the way back in the first game. But despite these varied possibilities, none of this actually allows change in the way that Ebert defined it. Mass Effect is designed with all of these possibilities in mind. Every choice you make, every branch that the narrative takes, was put there for a reason, and they all lend themselves toward a common theme. Nothing you do in this game is going to make the writers over at Bioware go, Uh, guys, this guy made a choice that we didn't put in the game. I don't, I don't, what do we do, guys? I don't, what do we do? Whether you decide to kill the Rachni Queen or release her, your choice will not deviate from the design of the game. Bioware created all of this and carefully planned out the decisions the player is able to make. Even in games with far less structure, or even just a larger variety of choices and endings, you're still working within the confines of the creator's vision. It's just a question of how broad that vision is. When it comes down to it, free will in video games is nothing more than an illusion of design. You're still constrained to the design of the game itself, and nothing you do is going to be able to alter what the creators, the artists behind the game, have made for you to experience. Now, there is modding, of course, but that's a completely different beast. When you're actually altering the code of the game, it's more analogous to something like a, like Pride, Prejudice, and Zombies, or those silly YouTube videos where they edit clips from a movie into different places to make it funny. It's not actually altering the artistic integrity of the original product, it's just using it to make something new and different. So really, in the end, this argument is just based on a misunderstanding that interactivity actually allows the player to alter the events of a story beyond the intent of its creator. But it also ignores another possibility, that maybe art can actually be designed specifically with that in mind. But that's another topic for another time. For now, it's enough to say that this argument raises some interesting questions, but it ultimately falls short on account of a misunderstanding about how video games actually work. And thus, this argument is invalid. So, what do you think about this? If you have anything else to say on this topic, or even if you think that my reasoning is just as flawed as the original argument itself, feel free to say so in the comments. Next week, we'll be talking about two distinct types of interactivity, and how they're used in storytelling in video games. Until then, class dismissed.